Welcome to Globe Watch with me, Charles Ebune. Stretching from the Atlantic east of the continent to the Red Sea, Africa's Sahel Belt qualified as one of the most poor and vulnerable regions of the world is facing a severe food crisis today. Well, that is according to the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Assistance, whose official is my guest today. Caught in the jigsaw pole of history and geography, the Sahel, which simply means shore coast in Arabic, is one of the most important regions in Africa and accounts for a greater part of the population. But today, food insecurity and conflicts in the region put the people at risk. It is often said in English traditions that even in the desert, there are oases, which simply means fertile places. Amidst crisis in the Sahel area of Africa, just how well can we exploit the oases of the region? Robert Piper, welcome to Globe Watch. Thank you, Charles. June 19 this year, in our first statement to the United Nations Security Council, UN Special Envoy for the Sahel, Gebra Selassie, said, and I quote, the humanitarian situation remains extremely fragile. Can you substantiate that statement? Indeed, we've had another tough year, 2014, uh, in the Sahel, very, very high numbers, uh, well above 20 million people are at risk of food insecurity across the nine countries of the Sahel region. We have 5 million children that are acutely malnourished, 1.5 of them severely so. We're looking at uh, 17 million people at risk of, of epidemics like uh, cholera, uh, uh, like uh, measles uh, and so forth. So the number's still uh, very high in terms of uh, humanitarian suffering. Let, let me just give you a quotation of, 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 of what you said last December. The Sahel crisis is getting away from us. The numbers are getting bigger, even though the harvest this year has been fractionally better than the average over the last five years. Can you explain to my audience the drivers of this food insecurity in the region? That's absolutely, yeah, it's a very good question. These humanitarian figures, these, are, these, these crisis numbers are really... Uh, keep going up even when the climate, say, is, is, is cooperative. So we're seeing food insecure numbers still increasing year by year. We're still seeing uh, malnutrition numbers uh, increasing year by year. We're still seeing uh, epidemic uh, numbers increasing year by year. The reason for that is that behind these uh, numbers are some big structural problems uh, in economies, in, in, in countries across the Sahel region, that if they're not reversed, we will stay in this permanent humanitarian chronic to, to crisis. To what extent can conflicts be blamed for this porous situation? No question today, if we look across the Sahel, the conflict in Mali has, had, has pushed some of these numbers up through the roof in terms of insecurity, in terms of food insecurity and malnutrition. Uh, the, the crisis in Nigeria is impacting this country and Niger very directly in terms of markets and so forth. So definitely man-made conflict, if you will, um, is a variable that is a, it's an important function of explaining, but explaining these numbers. But also, equally so, if not more so, are issues like population growth, the demographic momentum of the Sahel is such that it's terribly difficult for governments to get ahead uh, of the population growth in providing services for basic health, clean water, uh, sanitation services. Climate change is making it tougher and tougher uh, for farmers to, to, to make sure they get a good harvest. And that requires research, seeds that are going to be much more hardy with an erratic climate. It requires a lot more investment uh, in the management of, of water. Uh, what water we do have has to be managed much more effectively. When you do a cross-sector analysis of the issue, man-made causes and the natural environment which one overweighs the other of this situation we are describing? Well, uh, this has always been a tough, a tough part of the world. And, you know, I think these are the hardiest people when we look at the Sahel, the most resilient people perhaps on the planet, and they have been for centuries. 
Um, but certainly the man-made the man -made stuff is the big driver and, and that's, that's the good news and the bad news. And I think it's, uh, it's the bad news in terms of, of you can't blame uh, some sort of external, exclusively some sort of external factor. You're not going to get away with that. Uh, but the good news is we can do something about it largely. Uh, we can do something about demographic growth. We can do something about research into adaptive seeds. One of the big issues is climate change and there I don't know whether you want to call it natural or you want to call it man-made. I think uh, I'm going to have to call it man-made. And something that we find extraordinarily unjust about the Sahel is that consumption patterns of people on the other side of the planet are having a devastating impact on, on, on people across the Sahel. Just listen to another quotation from Gebra Selassie. I am encouraged by the high degree of ownership and political will demonstrated by Sahelian countries to foster peace, security, and development in the region. Uh, as we speak, French President um, Francois Hollande is in West Africa to discuss a, a series of security and economic issues. Is it really valuable to discuss that West African governments or those nine countries involved are really engaged in ensuring peace in the region? Well. Peace and security is not my mandate, uh, but certainly uh, uh, what I've witnessed is a tremendous amount of activity in the 18 months that I've been uh, in this job, a huge flurry of cooperation uh, across countries uh, around security, whether it is the whole Sahel um, and, and countries in Northern Africa, uh, whether it is uh, cooperation around Lake Chad. Uh, certainly we've seen an enormous uh, upsurge in collaboration. But in my field, in my area of emergencies and, and resilience, um, I certainly have witnessed uh, a, a sea change in the level of, of interest and engagement that governments uh, are making around trying to address these, uh, the chronic drivers of these humanitarian needs. Uh, it's not in the last 12 months for sure, it's been coming now for several years. Uh, but if I look at countries like Niger uh, that is investing enormous resources in, in, in nutrition and food security, I look at the way the Senegalese government is investing in safety nets, social protection programs. Um, definitely, I can uh, testify to the increase in political commitment from governments in the oh, Sahel. Oh, 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 what kind of environment have you seen in, in the countries you, you have made stopovers in, in the East region of Cameroon, you have been in the Central African Republic. What picture do you paint, because you are just from the field, to assess the, the, the terrain? Well, let me clarify. My role for, is for the nine Sahel countries primarily. And Absolutely. includes northern Cameroon. But I've also, because the Central African Republic crisis is affecting a, a number of Sahelian countries, I've also taken on a, a role to help coordinate on the regional sure. impact. Sure. I've just been to the east of Cameroon. I've had a chance to, 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 to see the situation of, uh, of the refugees who've come from, from the Central African Republic. I was uh, appalled at, at what they had at what they had been through, these refugees, in terms of suffering, some of them walking three months uh, to get to the sanctuary of, of Cameroon, story after story of enormous, enormous suffering and, and, and courage, but also terror and, and, and tragedy, uh, 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 sadly. Um, these refugees are today uh, uh, trying to put their lives together with the support of a lot of humanitarian agencies, but also the government of Cameroon. Um, and above all, the communities of Cameroon across the eastern part of this country. Enormous generosity in terms of the way families and communities have thrown their arms open to receive uh, this enormous influx. 110,000 people have shown up in this rather vulnerable part of Cameroon since January alone. So I'm coming away from the east of Cameroon with a real sense of of, of the scale of the, of the challenge, uh, but also an enormous sense of respect for the way the authorities here and the local communities are trying to, to show their solidarity for the people of the region. You, you, you know that um, uh, 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 mobilizing resources to solve uh, these issues uh, is a key element. We'll discuss that in a moment. But I just want to get from you which aspect of humanitarian assistance is urgent in these areas you have been visiting. Um, is it malnutrition, the refugee crisis, or 
generally uh, food insecurity. Well, this is what's complicated about Cameroon, and part of my reason for coming here is to is to is to better understand the, these issues, but also um, to to make sure we find a balance because Cameroon's got its own humanitarian. Problems in the north of this country, as I think we, st uh, I think I started by saying, there are substantial numbers of people that are food insecure, substantial numbers of children that are acutely malnourished, and as I said, we have a cholera epidemic underway right now that's taken 50 lives uh, uh, already. So on the one hand, Cameroon has got its own humanitarian needs. On the other hand, Cameroon is now hosting some 250,000 people that have come from around the region seeking sanctuary refugees from Nigeria and of course the big numbers uh, are from Central African Republic, many of whom have arrived this year but some of whom have been here since uh, as far back as 2006. So firstly, I don't want to see a trade-off between assisting vulnerable Cameroonians in the north of this country and terribly vulnerable refugees coming uh, from outside that have, have, have sought okay. sanctuary here. You, 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 were once, uh, 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 you once served as chief of staff for President Bill Clinton I when did. he was um, UN Special Envoy for the tsunami yes. uh, um, some years ago. Um, how are you using your globally strategic contacts to tap in resources in this area because one of the issues you have raised is that um, countries receiving refugees, there should be a relocation of resources. How are you exploiting your strategic contacts to get resources into these uh, communities? You know, the Syrian equation is still there, Ukraine, and there are so many other crises where money is needed. Well, it's not, a, um, it's, it's not a competition. This is something I have to be very careful about. We've got enormous needs in the Cameroon. Globally, humanitarian I'm, needs... I'm, I'm talking of the Sahelian belt yeah. in general. Well, I mean, this is, the, this is one of the great dilemmas of, 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 of our work because we have now $16 billion worth of humanitarian operations around the world, all chasing, you know, The Sahelian chasing money. needs how much of that? Sahel needs $2.2 billion of that $16 and billion. how much is available for the moment? Right now, about $550 million are in the bank. Largely insufficient. 24%, something like that, of the, of the overall So how needs. do you gather that resource? Well, you look, I think the first issue above all is to make sure that you've got a credible strategy. Donors are uh, exhausted by the sheer number and scale uh, of the humanitarian needs around the country. So we owe them a, an honest, clear and effective strategy. The fact that we are coming back to them year after year in the Sahel makes it even more absolutely crucial that we're not trying to simply put a band-aid over the problem and we're going to come back next year with the same set of problems, but that we are genuinely trying to target the underlying drivers. I, I know that issues. the former UN Special uh, uh, Envoy for the Sahel, uh, former Italian Prime Minister Romano Prodi, yeah. drew up a strategy which um, was expected to be like a Marshall Plan to mobilize resources for this uh, 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 volatile region. What is the content of that strategy and how is it being implemented today? Well, the, 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 the big uh, hallmark of this UN integrated strategy that you're referring to, which has now been approved by the Security Council, um, is a real effort uh, to bring together the different issues in one integrated strategy. So the, the strategy looks at uh, the issues of, of good governance in the region and, and, and the strength and support to states. It looks at security uh, and the management of borders, and it looks at humanitarian resi and resilience issues, how to break this cycle uh, uh, of humanitarian crisis. Um, the Security Council discussed the strategy as recently as a couple of weeks ago. You were mentioning, you were quoting from, from the envoy's uh, address to the Security Council at that time. It's coming together. Uh, we are seeing more and more projects come online, and very importantly, we're seeing other organisations like the European uh, Union, um, ECOWAS, the African Union, all of these strategies, and there are currently many Sahel strategies, are all starting to come together in a, a much more integrated Do, do you fashion. think that... Do you think that governments in, in, in this area can totally provide the internal funding for this humanitarian assistance without looking for out, outside sources? Humanitarian assistance? So, my piece of the puzzle? No, I no, don't. 
you doubt. I but don't. You, you, I don't think you, they you, can. You, you just talked a, a while ago about good governance. Yeah. Uh, let me just give you some statistics. Um, Nigeria loses about three hundred thousand barrels of petrol daily to mismanagement. That accounts to about. $2 billion monthly lost, which is, of course, the money you need. Do you think that there should be further good governance in these areas? There is a lot of petrol in northern Mali. There is a lot of petrol in Nigeria. There is uranium in, 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 in Niger. Do you think that these governments need to redefine their strategies to do a lot of internal funding for the moment? I think your point, your underlying point, is that there, there, that there is a, that governments can do much more themselves. Yeah, I started the interview by saying that I agree. Uh, uh, even in the desert, there are oases because yes. it, it's a difficult situation. But these are extremely rich countries. You're right, and I mean, you're right. And Nigeria is perhaps the the, the, the classic case where clearly they have they have the resources to be able to address the problems. And for that reason, frankly, um, the, our humanitarian financial appeal for Nigeria is a relatively modest uh, $70 million compared to the scale of the problem we have in Nigeria, which is much bigger even than the problem in Cameroon. And the reason why the request is relatively modest is because the government of Nigeria can and is investing in its humanitarian problems itself. But I think the, the, to a certain degree, to some level of, 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 of scale, you can say the same across all nine countries of the Sahel. But if we look at countries like Cameroon, which is relatively well off compared to, say, Niger or Chad, even these countries are having to redirect, for example, more and more funds to security to, to, because of the problems of the neighbourhood. And that has got to come from somewhere. And, and unfortunately, uh, some of it in places like Niger and even Cameroon are coming from the social sectors. I do not condemn in any way governments having to make these types of investments in their security. It's a basic, basic requirement of the state. Um, so I think for that reason, though, it, the onus is also on the international community to help governments offset the losses, if you will, that they have to go into security to make sure that they deliver on their social commitments. What could be the best way of ending this issue of chronic food insecurity in the Sahelian Delta? Well, we have to look at, at what, is, what are these underlying drivers of it. Clearly, we have water, uh, we have water in the region, these oases, as you say, uh, literally rather than metaphorically, um, that needs to be managed much better. We have a, a relatively small percentage of irrigatable land which is actually being irrigated and being used. Um, we have very insufficient research uh, into the kinds of seeds that we need to be more reliable during a very un uncertain uh, climate today. So, so what do we need? We need much more investment uh, in, in agriculture and agricultural research. We need more investment in, in water management and irrigation. Uh, we need a lot more investment uh, in the demographics issues. These are very sensitive, but the fact is that if countries like Niger continue to grow and double every 22 years, the task of just keeping up with that growth is, 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 is going to be impossible. So I want to see also definitely uh, investment in, 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 in terms of ma managing this population uh, dynamics. And, and perhaps, let me add, um, basic access to basic services, which again, we won't get in front of while the demographic growth um, is, 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 so, is so fast. Um, but water, sanitation, healthcare, these are fundamentals. When we look at uh, things like malnutrition rates, uh, it's one thing to treat an acutely malnourished child, but if we send them back to a house where they don't have access to clean water, uh, where the sanitation services are appalling, they will be back next year. So if we're going to break this cycle, we've got to invest not only in treatment today, but in the preventative uh, investments. Uh, two former guests uh, on this program ha have been uh, uh, the European Union Director for West and Central Africa, Peterus Upstus, yeah. and the former United Nations Special Representative to West Africa, Ahmed Ut Abdallah. Yes. And they told me that um, terrorism is a major issue and threat to opening a humanitarian corridor and passage and safety. You who work at the humanitarian office for the Sahel, just how much is terrorism a menace, a hindrance to 
your activities in the region? Um, insecurity is a growing problem for us in terms of accessing the people that we uh, need to serve. Uh, we, we need to serve millions of people in northern east Nigeria and our movement is, is highly uh, limited at the moment. Because you are afraid of kidnappings from Boko Haram and shutdowns like what we just saw in, in, in Ukraine a few days ago? Well, I mean, not the shutdown, shooting, but certainly uh, the, the, the threat from Boko Haram is very real. Um, Northern Mali now, um, and has been for a while, is very problematic uh, in terms of, of, of access. Uh, southern Niger, uh, close to the Nigerian border, is, is hugely uh, problematic. Um, so security is a big problem. Uh, uh, we, we use military escorts in some places, but we don't like to use military escorts as humanitarians. Uh, we want, uh, for us, uh, our greatest defence is the communities that we, that we serve. Uh, but certainly security is a problem. For example, we now spend a lot more money uh, on, on airplane, on aviation services. So we have people moving more by air than by road in some of these very big countries like Mauritania and, and Mali and Chad. That costs money. So it's affecting our access. It's affecting our budgets for sure. Okay. Now, uh, let's talk the progress you have made in this um, area. Um, which particular area of humanitarian assistance can you say that um, a lot has been done with uh, substantial uh, success? Well, if my, my first yardstick is the lives that we have saved. The, okay. Well, we have served just last year, uh, for example, um, 700,000 refugees have been kept alive by the work of the humanitarian team. But that's it, last year Sahel. you declared according to Reuters, that 16.5 million people are at risk of hunger and, 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 and food insecurity in that same area. Yes, uh, last year. And, sure. yeah, and we responded to over 10 million of those people received some kind of, 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 of food assistance uh, from the humanitarian team. Over 5 million farmers uh, received some kind of agricultural uh, assistance. So we have been working very hard last year. The problem, we've delivered services to, 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 to millions of people, whether it's in health, whether it's in agriculture, whether it's in, in food assistance, whether they are refugees. The great dilemma is here we are again this year with even more people in need. And, and that, is the, that is the fundamental question. Can I sh show you that we are reversing these trends? Have we got in front of these uh, indicators? No, we have not. And the great dilemma for people like me in the emergency area is that we don't have the tools in our toolbox to reverse uh, these numbers. What are the tools you need? We need long, we need governments making the right policy decisions. It's obviously not up to me uh, to put in place in, uh, uh, in Cameroon a strong social protection policy. That's not in my hands. Uh, we need long-term investment in institutions across the Sahel, multi-year support to institutions that are responsible for these sorts of policies. We need long-term investments in infrastructure like irrigation. These measures are not in my toolbox as an emergency guy. They're in the toolbox of governments. They're in the toolbox of their development partners like the World Bank and the African Development Bank. So I've got to, I've got to respond to today's caseload, uh, but I've got to be an ambassador for this caseload vis-a-vis -vis these governments, vis-a-vis -vis these development investors to make sure that if, we get, if we're going to get out of this business of emergency response in the region, um, the right investments are being made, the right policies are being put in place. You, you, you have worked in several areas of the world, final thought. Um, you have worked with the United Nations Development Program. You are an Australian. You, you have worked with the UN system for long. You have worked with President Clinton uh, and in India. Um, you, you, you did the arts in, in school, majoring in political sciences, and at one time, you are an actor in the famous uh, uh, All Stars. <laughs> if you were to play the role of an actor, yeah. what role would you play in the Sahel area? Oh, in a film? Oh, I've left that world behind. Uh, if you were to retake that world, if you were to, 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 to wear the casket, or I beg your pardon, if you were to wear the, 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 the the, the, the dressing of an actor today, what will you put on? What role will you take in that film? 
title the Sahelian drama. Uh, what role will you play? I think I'd rather be behind the camera, frankly. Uh, so you decide to be a cameraman? I think I have to be uh, at least uh, behind the scenes, because if I've learned anything over 25 years with the United Nations in this business, uh, it is the, 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 the lead role, the lead part in this play uh, has to be uh, a, a local one, has to be the government uh, of that country with, the, with their people. And so at best, at best, uh, we can play a supporting actor. Okay, uh, okay just one second, uh, David Piper, before I come to you. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks very much for watching today's edition of Globe Watch. You can follow us on Facebook, on Twitter, and of recent, you can now watch Globe Watch on YouTube. But before we separate, just to tell you that this year's United Nations Economic Report on Africa, published by the United Nations uh, Economic Commission for Africa and the African Union Commission, is in uh, uh, is already available for use, and it is a uh, dynamic industrial policy in Africa. On behalf of the entire production crew in Yaoundé, I'm Charles Ebune. Robert Piper, the United Nations Humanitarian Coordinator for the Sire. Thanks very much for accepting to be guest on my program today. Thank you, Charles. You're welcome. Many thanks.